Good morning. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Going to give it a second for some more participants to join. Excellent. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I want to welcome you to our webinar, Water in Agriculture, Agriculture Water Management in Rain-Fed and Irrigated Farming Systems. I'm Michael Saltz, and before we begin, I want to orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom of the screen, you'll see most of your controls. Please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, you can use the Q&A button in the toolbar on the left. Please indicate who your question is for, or you can ask a question to all of the panelists. <clears throat> you can ask questions throughout the event, and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources, including the full slide deck as soon as they're available. And you can also find those resources at agrilinks.org when they are uploaded. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Daniel Bailey. Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the capstone webinar of the uh, theme month for water in agriculture. I want to thank everyone who has submitted blog posts. Uh, we've, we have nine blog posts up for you to read. They're wide ranging and quite interesting and you'll definitely find something that is uh, within your specific interest. I welcome any additional blog posts to be submitted uh, as we wrap up this theme month. I'd like to also thank our panelists for joining us today and Rob Bertram for moderating the event and for the staff at AgriLinks for hosting. Uh, with that, I will hand it over to Rob Bertram, the Chief Scientist for Food and Agriculture at USAID. Thank you very much, Daniel, uh, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to have had a, a whole month focusing on water, and I think it's uh, maybe it's it's so fitting because the other thing, of course, that is dominating so much of our thinking and our challenges and our approaches now is climate change. And uh, water has always been essential in dealing with climate in agriculture or weather. Um, but I think with the added dimension of climate change, the uncertainty, the, the changes in, in water stress uh, during the year, the uncertainties of rainfall in dry seasons or dry rainy seasons without rainfall later onset, all of these things are uh, rightfully driving adaptation and I think water's at the heart of it. Um, the, uh, and I, you know, all, every sector that we work in in USA depends to one degree or another on water, but I think it's fair to say that, that food and agriculture uh, and, and household water security uh, are the two that are uh, most uh, most vulnerable. Uh, they All the sectors, in a sense, compete for water, rural, urban, uh, industrial, agriculture, households. So that's that's not new. It's just that we're in a more a stressed environment. But I think the good news is that we have uh, greater access to innovative tools, uh, better information systems, uh, digital approaches and such. And I know our speakers are going to be bringing out some of those topics today. But I want to say a bit more about, you know, why agriculture and food are, are so both dependent on, but also vulnerable to uh, uh, either excess or insufficient water. And that can do with total amount, timeliness, you know, so many variables come into play. So First of all, uh, those of you who know Feed the Future know that our top priority for our investments is the reduction of extreme poverty and the reduction of malnutrition, and particularly that measured by child stunting and, and, and wasting in some settings. And um, water is essential directly in terms of safety and such uh, and, and environmental uh, enteropathy, which is a, a huge challenge in, in our uh, areas where USAID works that are food insecure in particular. And then the other um, dimension is water is the, a critical component, particularly of the, the nutritious foods 
that are often in short supply or too expensive for, for the great bulk of uh, lower income people. So let's think about fruits and vegetables uh, and then especially animal source foods. And both of these kinds of, of groupings of food have substantial water uh, uh, requirements uh, in ways that go beyond perhaps um, many of the, the, the staple crops or the legumes that, that also make up a basis of our food systems and our uh, production systems. So I think um, thinking about that, uh, uh, also I wanted to mention pr processing. As we think about both the opportunity and the need for Africa's farmers in particular to respond to the growing demand for quality foods from African consumers, especially in cities and towns, uh, water is not just for the production, it's also for the processing, preparation, and, and, and uh, ultimately consumption of these safe, nutritious foods. So um, uh, I guess the other things that I think are, are that climate change is, is, is driving is that we've thought a lot about water and irrigation in the first 14 years of Feed the Future. I think we're also, because of all these changes, thinking more and more about water and rain fed systems. And the two are integrally linked because what happens to rainfall affects the hydrology. And we know this, that, that, that um, the, the availability of water, say for example, uh, irrig small scale irrigation or other irrigation stream flows, et cetera, also depends on what happens. And we know that in a lot of smallholder systems, half or three-fourths of, of rain fault can run off. And that doesn't give us that lasting uh, hydrological boost or the water security or the opportunity for exploiting water that comes from that. So we're thinking, I think, holistically now. And I notice uh, we have, for example, our new innovation lab, uh, Dr. LaFour is going to be speaking. That is one that um, includes mechanization now. And when you think about that, that opens up other opportunities for how we manage water beyond just irrigation per se. So I'm excited uh, about that. The other thing I want to call out is many of you have heard of the vision for adapted crops and soils. Uh, that is uh, Secretary Blinken's envoy, uh, special envoy for food security, Kerry Fowler, has really promoted this. And it has a big focus on soil health. And what I want to when, I, when we talk about it, I always say critical to soil health is water. You know, you're not going to change that ability of the soil to create that positive root environment, to uh, uh, create um, an active uh, rhizosphere, an active um, soil biota, we call it. And, and, and then the other piece that's critical is um, uh, organic matter and biomass. And again, that comes back to water in almost all the settings we, 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 we work in. So I think, you know, we need a holistic approach and I'm delighted. Hey Rob, we lost uh, audio on you. Sorry about that. I didn't turn it off. But anyway, look, I'm done anyway. I just want to say I, I, I think we have a terrific panel. And uh, now I'd like to, to, to really pick up this uh, comprehensive approach to water that we're seeking from water security in households all the way to uh, what ends up on the, the dining room table and everything in between. So. Sorry, Rob, we lost you again. Maybe the universe is trying to tell me something. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Michael, do you want me to, or Daniel, do you want me to introduce all three now? I think that's what you said, Michael, beforehand. Yes, yes, please. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to go from speaker to speaker, so that, that we'll have a nice flow, pun intended. And uh, okay, so Dr. Nicole Lafour is uh, dedicated to contributing to equitable, sustainable outcomes through agriculture, water management, intensification, particularly focused on smallholders. And I just want to say that I've known Nicole, Nicole for such a long time, and she has tremendous experience, decades in Africa, and then she's been leading in Feed the Future, much of our water 
uh, strategy uh, 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 for food security. So it's just a great pleasure. Uh, more than 30 years of international experience. She's currently the Associate Director for Sustainable Agriculture Water Management at the Daug Daugherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. And she's now, uh, we're thrilled to say, Director of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Irrigation and Mechanization Systems. Uh, her commitment to smallholders uh, is, is rooted in her family and her personal history on a farm in Oregon. And she's gonna to speak to us on the results from the recently concluded Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation. And, and then where the new, the new lab, which focuses on irrigation and mechanization systems will contribute. And I think the synergies there are, are, are really exciting. And then uh, following Nicole, we'll have Dr. Ku McMahon. Ku is, I, I would say an institution here in Washington uh, in USAID's work. And now he's a deputy director of the technical assistance division of the US International Development Finance Corporation. And Ku's been at the forefront of so much in terms of water innovation for as long as I can remember. He was at USAID for more than a decade leading securing water for food and energy, water for food and water for energy grand challenges. Uh, he has his PhD and also public health from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he uh, was a recipient of the National Science Foundation and EPA Star Fellowships. And in addition, he's developed a simple, low cost quality test for water in, in developing countries and emergency situations, which is a fantastic contribution. And Ku's remarks are going to focus on the urgent need for development finance to help farmers better address and utilize water saving technology. So water use efficiency is another theme that we promote across Feed the Future in production and post-production. So a uh, wonderful coup to have you here to cover those. And then our last speaker is Dr. Marie Soleil Tremel. Uh, Dr. Tremel is uh, a technical advisor for Catholic Relief Services. Uh, and the Water Smart Agriculture Platform in the Latin America and Caribbean region. So you can see the wonderful uh, continuum here we have uh, 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 across the three speakers. She's an agronomist and a soil scientist with 15 years of experience conducting research and extension uh, uh, to promote soil health, there it is, productivity and climate resilience on smallholder farming systems in Latin America. And Marie will speak on how managing soil to manage water, so that piece that I, I'm so glad you're going to get at that, Marie, uh, improves the productivity and climate resilience of rain-fed production systems. So a fantastic lineup, and I think now I will turn it to Dr. LaFour. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you, Rob. Can we move the slides forward, please? This is um, this, this is actually um, not Those my are slides. Not the right slides. <laughs> we need uh, Nicole's slides. Yeah, there, there we go. Thank you. Oh, bravo. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, and and thanks, Rob, for the introduction. Um. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the findings um, and some of the experiences of the Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation, which was led by Texas A&M from 2013 to 2023. And then I'll talk a bit about the new Innovation Lab. Next slide, please. So one of the key findings of the um, Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation was around nutrition and resilience. Um, irrigating households generally show higher dietary diversity and reduced childhood wasting. So we found evidence of, of improved Z scores amongst irrigators. Um, this wasn't surprising to some, but it's something that there wasn't a lot of evidence for, particularly when we looked at the pathways um, between irrigators and nutrition and resilience outcomes. 
And one thing that we found was that the income pathway was very strong in most, um, most contexts. So in other words, people irrigate, sell their produce, and then purchase other foodstuffs, including animal-based foods. And this was a very significant pathway in terms of improving household um, dietary diversity and nutrition. And we also found evidence for resilience through uh, droughts as well as long dry spells. Next slide, please. Yeah. Another important piece that we found uh, uh, strong evidence for consistently is that small scale irrigation is profitable, particularly for high value crops and um, that mechanized equipment for irrigation can be affordable over time. And one of the important things to, to mention here actually is that small scale irrigation in this case is not smallholder schemes, but smallholder systems. So these are systems that farmers invest in on their own. Um, this is small um, equipment. This is some uh, on field distribution. And this generally means that the farmers are operating and investing it on their own. And they're being pulled in by a high demand for fruits and vegetables and other types of products that need water, um, as well as for the changing climate. So this is a distinction from some of the large scale schemes because the farmers are doing this largely on their own. Uh, we found really strong profitability generally for vegetables as well as indigenous vegetables and for products such as irrigated fodder in Ethiopia. The um, other areas that were a bit more surprising to us was not necessarily irrigation, but the water needed for poultry or livestock or fish farming. So some of the market for irrigation equipment or pumps is actually found not for irrigators, but for other um, producers in the ag value chains. Some staples are less profitable than others, but generally we found that farmers are investing in the types of high density or high nutrition density foods um, that contribute to both dietary diversity and health, um, as well as profitability for the farmers themselves. Next slide, please. So one of the types of equipment that we looked at was solar irrigation. And solar irrigation has really um, become much more available on markets and solar irrigation equipment suppliers are really expanding into the global south markets. And with all of the excitement around solar irrigation, we wanted to understand more about the profitability as well as the sustainability. So solar irrigation equipment providers are innovating really rapidly in terms of last mile credit to farmers. So PAYGO systems, rent to own, and other approaches that make solar pumps more accessible to farmers. And we found consistently that over a period of two or sometimes less um, years, farmers are able to actually pay back those pumps that they are provided on credit. And um, we're seeing a lot of other innovations in the finance sector in terms of using climate or in terms of using um, carbon credits and other types of climate related finance to be able to reduce the price of, of pumps to farmers. So this is a very exciting field. Um, this is the first time that we've really seen this type of innovation in terms of providing pumps on credit. Um, but this comes with a caveat around water resource management. Small scale irrigation, as I mentioned, means that it's outside of schemes, which means that these farmers are usually dispersed and they're not sitting or participating in any form of water user association or not even necessarily a water management or watershed organization. So this means that small scale irrigation can be really difficult to manage and monitor um, at watershed or larger scales. So we're also um, working with companies in terms of the digital tools that are available to monitor water and natural resource use um, as solar irrigation continues to expand. The other thing that we find is that um, whilst the Finance innovations are very exciting and it's enabling some farmers to purchase and invest in pumps that they couldn't necessarily otherwise. 
they do tend to be farmers who already have higher income. So there is also some concern around whether or not solar irrigation, unless there is some support in that, um, in that market, there could be a widening income and social disparity between farmers. Next slide, please. And this kind of touches on another point, which is that market system interventions are really important in terms of supporting positive outcomes for investments in small scale irrigation. Uh, the, you know, in the past, we oftentimes had focused very much on equipment supply and supporting equipment supply and, and removing the constraints to access markets for equipment. But through the research that we did and through the partnerships we had, we really found that it's important to facilitate different types of partnerships and dialogues and that it's important to look at opportunities to bundle different inputs. So this means things like um, creating or facilitating partnerships between borehole drillers, pump suppliers, pipe and sprinkler suppliers, and other types of input suppliers. And this was something that these um, companies did once they came together and, and that opportunity was facilitated. And then they would look at opportunities further to bundle these multiple inputs um, to be able to offer one um, loan to farmers to be able to, to purchase all at once. However, um, I do have to say that the engagement with the finance sector in terms of irrigation and, and particularly small scale irrigation has been relatively weak with income countries. Um, the solar pump, industry is, is, as I mentioned, very innovative and looking at climate finance at manufacturing and higher levels. But we do see a strong need for further um, engagement with the finance sector, um, because as you solve one part of the bottleneck or constraint for finance for irrigation, so that's at last mile finance, then it increases the need for finance at other levels, such as at distributor levels or other inputs um, within that ecosystem. Next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, great, thank you. So this is one area that I personally work on a lot, which is um, looking at gender and access to irrigation for women. Uh, women farmers continue to have lower access to credit despite a lot of innovations in finance, and they continue to have lower access to inputs and different types of equipment. Asset-based finance for solar irrigation pumps appeared to us initially to be a good solution to reach women, but we found a lot of constraints affected women more than men. So, for example, um, even from the demand side, women farmers tend to be more risk averse about um, going into debt and taking out equipment on credit. And they want to ensure that they have all the inputs available and markets for their products before they're willing to um, take out loans or before they're willing to invest in, in equipment. And the other thing is from the supply side, then the, um, the companies that offer credit still continue to use the same types of financial criteria before they're willing to provide women with pumps on PAYGO systems or, or rent to own. And so it is um, a risk, therefore, in terms of disempowering women or creating greater disparities unless you have some interventions to specifically reach women. Um, another important point that we found across quite a few companies is that pumps are considered significant assets within the household. And they're equated, for example, with something like cattle. So once, even if a woman purchases a pump or is given a pump or gets a pump with a type of subsidy to reduce the cost to women farmers, it still can become property of men in the household. So just um, you know, working through some of the ways to reach more women um, doesn't necessarily overcome some of the intra-household um, constraints to women to be able to invest and, and benefit. Those are just some examples. Um, I do want to um, say that we found a, a strong demand from women in the poultry sector, um, as well as women in um, livestock and fish farming. So that was another thing that appeared as a constraint where the companies that were providing um, pumps on credit 
were only considering crops um, and irrigation. They weren't considering some of the other ways that women use the pumps um, for uh, their income. So there's a lot of work yet to be done with the companies in terms of adapting how they offer finance. Uh, one last point on the on the gender. I told you I worked on this a lot, so it's, it's very close to my heart. And, and it's really important when you consider how many women are producers or labor for um, for agriculture across the global south. But one thing that the companies tried was increasing the number of women sales agents, thinking that they would sell more to women. And we found that that was not an effective measure. And um, that regardless of whether the sales agent was a woman or a man, um, they all tend to go for the, the um, perceived higher income farmers, which tend to be male. So the solutions for reaching women are not necessarily obvious, and it definitely requires more investments and uh, more partnerships to understand. So next slide, please. So um, I want to talk just briefly about the new innovation lab. I'm, I'm very privileged to be able to lead a second lab. Um, this is the Irrigation and Mechanization Systems Lab, which just began three months ago. This lab is led by the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska. Um, next slide, please. So I'm, I'm not going to read this slide to you, um, but I'll talk a, a little bit about um, some of the examples of things that we would like to focus on and why. Um, this design of this innovation lab was in part um, kind of inspired by some of the gaps that we continued to see in the innovation lab for small scale irrigation and was also informed by other projects that are led by the Doherty Water for Food Institute, as well as engagement with other types of projects and programs globally. Um, one of the areas that, that Rob mentioned was that rain-fed systems are incredibly important in the Global South. And this was something that we wanted to look at more. So this innovation lab will look at the suitability of bundles of technologies, services, practices, types of finance. And um, this will go from rain fed to supplemental irrigation to shoulder seasons um, where we're able to um, benefit from uh, soil and water moisture and then um, all the way to supplemental irrigation in the dry season. So this takes a really broad perspective of understanding the agricultural and food systems and the role of water in that. So it is going to um, also therefore be able to include interactions between these small scale irrigators and small scale systems with irrigation schemes as well. So it's, it's a much broader um, perspective in terms of where water is needed in the system and how to use that optimally. And we'll really focus on suitability um, based on context, because context is extremely important with irrigation, um, but as well as the types of markets um, that we're working in. Another aspect is, as mentioned earlier, it's about strengthening the institutions for natural resource governance and, and climate resilience. Um, small scale irrigators are often outside of institutions. Um, and on the other hand, some institutions are not necessarily keeping up with the demands on water um, under climate change. So there'll be a strong attention to strengthening institutions and ensuring sustainability of natural resources. We'll continue to look at issues in this lab as, as was done under the previous innovation lab and other innovation labs that Feed the Future supports around inclusivity. Um, markets are an important element of reaching farmers, but um, equitability has to be at the forefront of these um, interventions. And so under that, one of the things that we will look at is irrigation as a service, or what some people call irrigation service provision, and mechanization as a service. There will be some people who cannot purchase or invest in equipment, and there are some who don't need to invest in equipment. And so this will be a strong focus of this innovation lab is understanding uh, service provision and entrepreneurial opportunities through that and how well those are able to serve the different needs of, of different segments of the, of the farmer market. 
Under this innovation lab, we also have put capacity as a research question. Um, a lot of innovation labs and other Feed the Future projects work on capacity development. But we hear a lot from both mechanization or equipment suppliers and, and irrigation systems that um, they don't have the skills that are needed as the market is expanding. So the companies are looking for people with particular types of skills and they don't find them in the system. So in this particular case, we want to be able to ask, well, what is it the skills that you need? What types of skills, what kinds of services, how many people with these different types of skills are needed in different market systems? Um, so we've really turned the capacity um, issue into a question in order to ensure that we're targeting that properly. Um, and then we will also look as we're going along about nutrition and also health and inclusivity that happens alongside and in, in parallel with irrigation development. As, as Rob mentioned, um, mechanization actually has a really good fit with this, um, the topics of agricultural water management. Um, this is a surprise to some people, but irrigation is often the first form of mechanization that takes place for smallholders. Um, they're mechanizing water lifting, so they're buying pumps, and that's often the first investment they make in mechanization. And also, irrigators tend to adopt more inputs to be successful, so mechanization also fits with the expansion of irrigation. And um, it also enables us to look at that full range from rain fed to supplemental to um, dry season irrigation. So these are some of the examples of where we will be, um, some of the topics we'll focus on. And initially we intend in this lab to focus in Nepal, um, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Ghana, Guatemala, and Honduras um, with the potential to um, include further countries as, as the innovation lab expands and develops. And with that, I will hand back over to Rob um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk a bit about the new lab. Well, thanks, Nicole. That was a terrific overview and so exciting to see the new challenge ahead. I think my role here is just to pass it to Ku. We had introductions earlier. Uh, Ku, uh, so great to have you and uh, over to you. I had to take myself off mute. Thanks, Rob. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining today for AgriLinks. Uh, you know, water and food is dear to my heart. Can't have life without a combination of both. Uh, and sorry about that. Uh, and so what I found is, you know, in my time at USAID, now at DFC, um, trying to understand the interlinkages between economics and poverty, um, between food security and between water security or, and energy security at this point are critical um, to deal and address climate change issues. And so uh, a couple of stories just from uh, the end of my time at Water and Energy for Food and one from securing water for food. Uh, last year, I spent about four months on the road uh, out in the field in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Southeast Asia and in South Asia, talking to farmers and, and the companies that are developing all these technologies. And one of the things that I found uh, in South Africa, you know, a woman-led uh, family firm um, took over a huge agroforestry operation reduce water consumption by 40% with cheap soil moisture sensors, but it also integrated other things, including uh, bringing in uh, young students to monitor tree health and crop health and soil health. And they were able to improve, improve, improve productivity by about 45% um, on that farm. Now, that being said, you know, with climate change, I, you know, one of the things I've been more concerned about recently is you bring all these great technologies in, but what about the water? And so I was asking both the students and, and the, the uh, woman that owned the property, you know, what is gonna happen, uh, you know, if your water um, uh, productivity goes down or, you know, if it stops raining for six months or, you know, if you're not able to have access to irrigated, um, technologies in the future just because prices go up right and you know it was something that had they hadn't even thought about before they were more focused on the here and now and i think that that's one of the things 
you know, we all have to focus on uh, for the next 20 to 30 years is as climate change is not something that is in the future, it is happening right now. Uh, we need to focus more on how to help people adapt uh, to the things they're not thinking about. One of the things that Rob mentioned and Nicole mentioned earlier was on access to information and information technology. And it's critical uh, for farmer success over the next 20 years that we provide them with access to that information specifically around how much water is available, not just from uh, surface water, but from groundwater sources. One of the other things I learned from that specific uh, trip was they didn't really know how much groundwater they had. Um, and they didn't see that coming from other places. And that actually transitioned into uh, the next trip I took to, to Zambia, where I was uh, talking with a woman. Well, it was a woman who had previously worked for NASA uh, who had gone back home uh, to help her father set up a farm, and she was using great uh, crop rotations, uh, you know, improving soil fertility, using uh, water resources well, and they had an abundance of water resources, uh, unlike others. And her biggest concern was around, you know, where was she going to have enough uh, places to send the food that she was helping increase the productivity of. She was using renewable energy. Everything was working. She actually paid off her loan already. And so, you know, trying to think about those things. Um, I then went to India and I talked to a village of about 65 different farmers who had brought in um, soil moisture sensors and agricultural irrigation technology, but they were broke. And they were very frustrated that they weren't getting enough support in loans uh, to address uh, those types of technologies. Now, I tell all of these stories to bring us back to the reason we all do this work, and that's the people at the end of the day. We all recognize we've got 9 billion plus, that food insecurity is growing, that water security is declining, that our groundwater resources, as noted by the Nature uh, study from last week, globally overall is shrinking, even though in some places they're actually getting stronger uh, groundwater uh, resources, and that the monitoring and the information connected to the monitoring has declined over the last 25 years. And so that leads us to the place where we need to think differently of how we're going to engage the science, the finance, the farmers, and the systems uh, that connect these things to better address um, these challenges, because we need to become more productive in agriculture, uh, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa, but also now in South Asia, uh, as saltwater intrusion has increased, um, and both due to climate change and an overconsumption of water resources. And so one of the things that the program uh, that um, ADA uh, now leads, uh, Water and Energy for Food, is focused on, and a systems approach is taking a look at how much water is actually available in systems, so the best ability of our, you know, to take a look at, uh, both uh, with the International Water Management Institute uh, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and then also with others in a consortium working in the Middle East, where water is a critical issue. Uh, and they hope then to expand to South and Southeast Asia to take a look at, should we be funding technologies to extract more groundwater if there's no more groundwater available, right? And so it's a, a healthy balance that needs to be achieved there. The other thing I'd say is, you know, echoing something that Nicole said about women, you know, they recommend, you know, they make up 70% of the smallholder farmer group. And, you know, there needs to be increased attention and focus to them. Another a place I um, visited in uh, Zambia was a woman farmer who actually wasn't a farmer at first. She was, you know, a, a clerk, but she, you know, was interested in farming. She got access through um, one of the companies that uh, Water and Energy for Food was supporting to a loan, which unlike, as Nicole said, some of the other uh, loans were, didn't require upfront capital. And it was critical to her success because she was able to first start uh, to get basic irrigated uh, agriculture and energy from biogas solutions. And then she was able to then expand into farming uh, with cattle. Uh, then she was expanding in, into chickens. And it increased her net wealth about eightfold in less than a year. And she was then able to help other farmers and give loans to other people. So it talks about the multiplicative effect 
that one alone uh, can have. And obviously that's an anecdotal piece, but it speaks to something specific about how we need to change the way we think about financing. And so that's the important part about making loans um, a farmer's friend. Um, someone uh, earlier had spoken about that we need to increase development financing. And it needs to trickle all the way down to both smallholder farmers and farmer collectives. Because what we're finding is if you give a little bit of capital at the bottom, it elevates it at the top. And that's one of the things now uh, we at D uh, DFC, the US International Development Finance Corporation are focused on is increasing the availability of appropriate timing of financial products and tools uh, so that we can improve global agribusiness, which also goes to the bottom and broadening access to working capital uh, for trade and finance, not just capital expenditures, and ex enabling the scale of local and regional debt uh, to serve the ag SMEs, farmer cooperatives, and then hopefully to funnel down to the small and medium enterprises that are directly working with farmers. Now, that is set in the context of climate change. And so primarily, you know, we have to reduce food loss. A lot of the water and agriculture uh, is lost if you grow it and it just either withers on the vine or doesn't make it to the actual end consumer. And so if we can reduce that third of food loss and waste through more efficient energy practices, uh, through solar cooling, et cetera, that is a way to help reduce water loss. Improving inputs on fertilizer side and around application, the energy efficient inter irrigation practice, including solar irrigation, but in a sustainable way to make sure we aren't over abstracting from groundwater resources and sustainable intensification, as we talked about. And the next speaker will talk about that uh, with soil and soil fertility. And so those things, along with cattle, along with, you know, chickens and animal husbandry for water use are critical to helping us meet those global demands for food need, uh, while also, you know, being mindful of the changes we have in climate, helping farmers and uh, others adapt to climate change in a more efficient way. And so, you know, I want to make sure that the last speaker has more than enough time. So with that, Rob, I turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ku. And I love the, the way that we can see sort of a continuum here where these initial investments then pave the way for actually access to formal finance. And that's that's a great message and I think critical in many dimensions, uh, but particularly where we're talking about capital, which is one of our great challenges. So thank you. So now we'll turn to uh, Dr. Marie Soleil Turmel. Marie Soleil, over to you. Great, thank you, Rob. So I'm going to speak on managing soil to manage water, uh, the water smart agriculture uh, approach to improve productivity, climate resilience, and climate resilience of rain fed production systems. So I'm gonna start with what is WSA, why it works, and uh, present some evidence from the field of the impacts. Next slide, please. So the area that I'm going to focus on in the sem seminar is the Central American Dry Corridor. Uh, this is a region that runs along the Pacific side of Central America. We're working mostly in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Um, these crops, um, the basic grain crops are produced in hillside agricultural systems. And it's estimated that um, up to 74% of these agricultural soils are in a state of degradation. And this region has been defined over the past 10 years as one of the regions with the highest vulnerability to climate change. The main threat being uh, erratic rainfall uh, and droughts that occur right in the main um, uh, staple crop production season uh, that can lead to severe yield damage. Uh, and according to the World Food Program, hunger has increased fourfold in Central America um, for, since uh, 2018, affecting close to 8 million people. Next slide, please. So our approach in water smart agriculture is to manage soils, to manage water in these uh, rain fed systems that are water limited, um, thus improving productivity and drought resilience. So in rain fed systems, 
part of the water that falls uh, is lost in runoff and evaporation, and only part of this infiltrates into the soil and becomes what is known as green water that is available for uh, crop production. So degraded soils, uh, poorly managed soils, um, infiltrate uh, less of this water, they store less water, and they can dry out faster in periods uh, without rain. Whereas well-managed, healthy soils uh, retain more of this green water, which means that uh, crops are less impacted by periods without rain, and the overall productivity of these water-limited systems uh, is improved. Uh, the good news is that uh, with water smart agriculture practices, we can improve the green water uh, potential of soils. Next slide, please. So what are the WSA practices? Well, the fundamental um, principle is to restore the soil so that we can capture uh, and store soil water. So all of these practices um, contribute to that. Um, and so combining these practices, uh, also ensure both short and long-term gains for farmers. We are talking about minimal soil movement, um, so zero or uh, minimal um, uh, tillage, improving um, the permanent cover of soils with either crop residues or cover crops, um, always keeping the soil covered. Integrated soil fertility, fertility management, this includes um, managing uh, soil acidity problems and also overall crop uh, nutrition and efficient fertilizer use. And agroforestry, um, very important in these hillside uh, systems to stabilize soil, add biomass to the system, and uh, crop diversification and cover crops, also key um, in all cropping systems, um, but also to ensure um, a good residue cover and adding more soil, building soil, more soil organic matter and uh, keeping the soils covered. So uh, these systems, uh, these uh, product, uh, practices contribute to these both short and long-term gains for farmers um, and improve the productivity and um, drought resilience of the system. Next, please. So I'd like to show you uh, some photos um, that I've taken in the field in, these are from Guatemala. Um, just an example of what these landscapes look like. Um, these um, high uh, hillside uh, systems where um, there's de deforestation to grow uh, staple food crops and very high um, degrees of soil degradation. Next, please. And here's an example of in these systems, uh, the WSA practices implemented. Uh, so we can see complete residue cover. There's no exposed soil there. Uh, we have tree uh, rows in the system. This is Gliracidia. It's a leguminous tree that's pruned down right before the cropping system, adding more biomass and more cover, but permitting the, the production of those grain crops in the system. And just to note that this, this system in Guatemala in, in Chorti is known as Cucharum, which means uh, my land uh, has good soil water or good soil moisture. Next, please. And up close here, when we go to the field, farmers love to show us how their soils are retaining more moisture with these practices. Um, and uh, un we're looking underneath the, the residue cover there where the soil moisture is retained and even into the dry season after the main crop has been harvested on the uh, left-hand side, we see the farmers continuing to grow a, um, a cover crop um, and um, with this re residual soil moisture. Next, please. So as part of the WSA program, uh, we have invested in um, building evidence in a collaborative way with farmers on farms. We established over 3,000 side-by-side innovation plots where we compare WSA practices to uh, the local practice or conventional uh, practice. Um, where, and we monitored key indicators on soil health, moisture, uh, productivity, uh, costs and income. And these, um, these plots also form uh, the center of our uh, farmer to farmer learning and in the farmer field schools, promoting the adoption of practices. Next, please. So these changes um, 
in with the implementation of the practices um, uh, result in better soil health and translate into greater soil moisture retention. As an example, in 2018, we had the most severe drought during the monitoring period um, in this program. Um, and in July, when this dry spell occurs during the, crop, the main uh, maize corn cropping season, um, this re the region received um, less than half of the, the average rainfall, in some cases even, even more severe. Um, and so under these conditions, a WSA, uh, with the WSA practices, we were able to maintain um, up to 26% more soil moisture, which was very critical. Um, in maintaining uh, or at least get, getting a, a decent harvest um, in some cases where farmers were not harvesting nearly enough to meet their food security needs. Um, and on average, uh, yields were 39% um, higher uh, compared to the plots without the WSA practices. Next, please. So um, these improvements in soil health and soil water translate into improved rainwater productivity. So this is the amount of crop produced per amount of rainfall, essentially uh, crop per drop. And uh, this is a good indicator of how efficiently our, our rain fed systems are, are using um, rainwater. So we found with these practices, um, rainwater productivity is increasing. At the beginning of our monitoring period, there was, there was a 20% increase right away, mainly from also improvements in crop nutrition, um, but as the soil health improved, um, the WSA practices um, continued to uh, improve in their rainwater productivity. And by uh, 2019, we found a 40% increase in uh, rainwater productivity. And it's interesting to note that these, the first year and the last year had similar uh, amounts of rainfall. Um, and we found this big boost with uh, WSA. So uh, this really means that um, you know, these systems with WSA are, are high higher in productivity. So maize yields on average across the monitoring uh, period were 41% higher. Bean yields were also 37% higher. And um, really interesting to note that with these practices, we're getting closer to what's uh, considered the, uh, the rain-fed the rain yield potential uh, for the region, even in these smallholder systems. So um, these differences are especially critical in a drought year um, where WSA has the potential to make the difference between food security um, or not harvesting enough to meet uh, the, the food needs of the family and really can reduce the, the need for um, food aid. So we estimated um, that 33% more farmers would still be able to meet their basic um, maize production needs in a very severe drought year um, if they produced uh, using WSA management practices. Next, please. So um, water smart agriculture doesn't uh, only have positive impacts on, the, uh, on water and soils and climate resilience at the farm level, but also at the landscape level due to um, this improved rainwater infiltration in the systems. So uh, some really great work done by the CRS team in El Salvador and partners um, using erosion plots estimated that with the WSA practices, um, we can increase rainwater infiltration by up to a thousand cubic meters per hectare per year on average. So when these practices are applied across the landscape, WSA can contribute to the recharge of vital um, aquifers that supply communities with water and provide water for irrigation. Next, please. So what do farmers think of WSA? So in addition to the quantitative evidence on impacts, we also spoke with farmers to uh, understand their perceptions, you know, which really indicates the likelihood that these uh, farming uh, communities will be able to adopt these practices in the long term. We spoke to 1,500 farmers about the changes they were seeing with WSA. And overall, there was an extremely positive uh, perception of, of the WSA practices, uh, with over 80% reporting improvements in production, livelihoods, uh, food security, soils, and drought resilience, um, and an overall satisfaction with the practices. 
Uh, we're currently finalizing a formal adoption study since uh, four years have passed um, since the end of the first phase. And uh, we'll be sharing those results later this year. Next, please. So um, WS, I wanted to speak about how we're taking WSA to scale in the, in the LACRO, Latin American Caribbean region. So WSA forms um, the foundation of all of our agricultural programming in the region, where we're also working on extension systems, market systems, youth and gender to build uh, prosperous and inclusive climate resilient communities. Uh, since 2020, we've raised $139 million for WSA-related programming in our six uh, LACRO countries, and we've reached over 100,000 families directly. Uh, about 22% of this um, is BHA, Emergency Response and Disaster Risk, Risk Reduction Programming, where we're now incorporating WSA to build long-term resilience in these communities. And our goal is to reach uh, 500,000 uh, families by 2030 in LACRO. And of course, this means working with key agricultural institutions in each country. We're currently collaborating with over 100 agricultural institutions from local to regional level to align our efforts around soil and water and to achieve transformation at scale. Next, please. Um, so lastly, uh, you can learn more about uh, WSA in this report that was just published um, at the end of last year by the Stockholm International Water Institute and the SLU, where WSA in Central America is featured as one of the four case studies on rain fed systems in different parts of the world. And that is it. Thank you. Next slide. <laughs> Back to you, Rob. Thank you. Wow, well, what a wonderful way to bring us home. Uh, thank you, Marie Soleil. It's uh, really gratifying. And I think, again, we're seeing this, this uh, message of the connection between what happens in the landscape, this picture is a good example, and what happens downstream in the villages and in irrigated systems and in uh, all kinds of uh, things related to both food and nutrition security, but also water security. So, so I have to tell you, we have a very rich uh, uh, a set of uh, uh, questions coming in, and I'm going to do my best to try to, to uh, uh, capture some of them. Um, so, so one thing, let's, maybe we can start with, uh, you know, we're, we're all excited to see irrigation expand and to see water smart management, water smart agriculture expand as a complement to it. Uh, but how, what, what's the situation with aquifers? Is maybe, I, maybe this is for you, Nicole. Uh, you know, we often hear that Africa has underexploited groundwater. Maybe the same is true in parts of Central America and elsewhere. But uh, what, what you, you mentioned some of the issues around the water resource. Uh, what, can you take a, a bit more of a global view for our, our, our questioner, who is John Engels? Yeah, I mean, it's actually quite difficult to take a global view because groundwater <laughs> is so context specific. You okay. know, we don't have anything like a global aquifer. Um, and so the aquifers really have to be examined quite locally. Um, I think one of the important things to mention here is not to separate groundwater from surface water. Um, it's really important to look at those together, and I think it's a mistake that sometimes is made, is that we're not considering surface water and, and groundwater together. And we really have to understand better the dynamics in a particular system in terms of groundwater recharge. So there are definitely aquifers that we see where there is sufficient um, recharge and there's still high potential for irrigation development. Um, and of course, there's other areas where we already see depletion. You know, there's areas of Indri in, uh, excuse me, India where there's depletion and even small parts of Ghana or um, Ethiopia where we see at least um, seasonal or we can see the potential for, for depletion. So, you know, my message here is understanding 
the local aquifers in um, terms of conjunctive water use, so that surface water plus the groundwater. And then, you know, really touching on Marie's um, presentation and, and thinking about um, you know, thinking about the soil, thinking about, um, you know, the dynamics of, of recharge and using both blue and green water so that we're not depleting aquifers and, and we're using the um, soil and, and the, managing the soil water moisture to the best benefit. So it's a really yeah. difficult question to answer <laughs> because it is so local, um, except that just we're very clear that there is caution that's needed. And that's one of the reasons why we have to look at the whole rain fed to, to supplemental to dry season irrigation and include um, soil water moisture um, as, we're, as we're going forward, because we do need to manage the risks, but managing the risks requires all of those things. Great, thank you so much. Um, Ku, I'm going to turn to you now. Uh, we have a, a number of areas where gender has come up, and I think there there are questions here about how you know what can we do to help ensure that, that we level the playing field in terms of finance, uh, 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 you know, in terms of women being able to benefit. I know Nicole flagged a couple of the the challenges there, but at, at DFC you must deal with this challenge in a number of respects. And I'm just curious uh, if you could say a bit more on that e equity issue, particularly with respect to gender. So I think part of it um, is in finance, it's often debt in collateral. Um, and especially in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and other areas where there's a lot of currency fluctuation, collateral is the way in which people often uh, reduce the risk of providing financing. Uh, now, as everyone knows, land is the number one way people normally use for collateral, land and property, which in many countries is either owned directly by men or solely by men. Um, and so even if uh, the women on the farm should have access to uh, that same, or access to equity in that collateral per se, they don't. Uh, and so one of the things that we've seen uh, consistently that is a way in which we can improve upon that is shifting away from uh, using land as a ter uh, term for collateral uh, for specifically agriculture and also uh, using information systems on a farmer's productivity over time uh, to help drive the likelihood they'll, they'll repay a loan. Um, and so what we've seen uh, both uh, in India, where there have been some strengths and weaknesses with microfinance institutions, uh, but also in Southeast Asia and now in Sub-Saharan Africa, is if you can build up a, a history through uh, farmers use associations um, or uh, either water use associations sometimes or farmer cooperatives, you can show farmers have significantly increased yields when they've been provided uh, quality inputs or they've at least maintained their yields, assuming obviously there wasn't a drought that year. So by shifting to information systems based on data, um, on actual productivity, rather than just solely on collateral, uh, which is what traditional finance institutions would use, you're more likely to have uh, quality data of farmers ability to repay on a loan. Great, uh, thank you very much, Ku. Um, Marie Soleil, um, you know, that was, that was a, for me, it was a very heartwarming presentation you gave in terms of the, the, the connectedness of all of this. And it really seemed like you had win, win, win coming out in terms of farmers, people who live downstream, uh, 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 people who are looking for water for other uses. And I guess um, I'd be interested in, in, in the systems where you work and your experience in the dry corridor, how does the approach you described connect to or otherwise with water catchments and 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 the the, the, the sort of incentives for water infrastructure development and use? I, I I seem to recall the World Bank did a lot of investment in that space, as did USAID in the dry corridor. Could you say a bit about that? particular connectedness? I know it's an interest of, to a lot of people in, in USAID and uh, the community. 
Yeah, thank you, Rob. Yeah, I mean, we we, we definitely um, understand this linkage between managing soil at the plot level, at the farm level, and how this has um, landscape level impacts. Um, and we, we're really um, supporting uh, community level planning where uh, these decisions can be made in, at the water catchment level um, and building that capacity to manage uh, natural resources at the community and watershed level to protect um, uh, the, the water resources. Um, a lot of the areas we work um, are also coffee lands which there's a really high correlation between where coffee is produced and where these really important water recharge areas. So we're doing a lot to support those farmers with their production practices and making sure that these stay agroforestry systems also. Um, and, and also there's there have been some movement um, at the political level to um, have policies in place to support these practices and support farmers to implement the practices, recognizing um, how vital they are for protecting water resources. Thank you. Great, great. Yeah, I, I know. Uh, uh, you, I'm glad you mentioned the coffee piece. That's a that's a, an area of particular interest for some of our missions. Uh, but also this issue, which you talked about, of integrating perennials and uh, of various kinds, I think, including trees. But uh, uh, as another area where perhaps we can uh, do more. Um, so we also had um, a question, and maybe this is for you, Nicole, is uh, how do you prioritize if effective investments over modernizing existing water infrastructure over new infrastructure? How much of that kind of discussion goes on? I see Ku nodding too, so please, yeah. Ku, feel free to comment on this. Yeah, so this, I, is, this is not, this, this isn't a by the way. Yeah, this isn't a question I can answer alone or in, in a short period of time. I mean, this has been a tension for a long time of the question of, you know, do we build new or do we continue to rehabilitate? Um, and I do want to say under the previous irrigation innovation lab, we didn't really look at infrastructure because we focused on small scale or household systems. Um, but but this is something that I've looked at in, in other projects. Um, yeah, it's... There are some irrigation schemes that are, are doing very well about main maintenance and and um, there also is a good case for rehabilitation in some in some um, systems. But um, I think that there is also a trend to kind of move away from the extremely large infrastructure based concrete based um, irrigation programs that we've seen in the past and, and moving to much more flexible smaller systems or even medium-sized systems um, that are much more, more manageable. But this is a, it's a huge tension on the, you know, build, then we see the decline, then rehabilitate. And um, there, there really isn't an easy answer to that, except looking at systems that are much more flexible and small and that can be repaired more easily. But I'll, I'll hand over to Ku on this. It's, it's a tough question. Yeah, I'm sure it comes up, Ku, in your world in terms of yeah, investment. It definitely finance. does. Uh, what we are finding is um, sustainable infrastructure um, only happens if you take into account the natural landscape, uh, which for you know many years was ignored or destroyed. Uh, and so as we've recently started uh, development impact bonds around uh, agroecology or climate change to help shift us away from uh, intensive, uh, applications of, as Nicole said, concrete and to more sustainable systems with, you know, natural soil landscapes, you know, mangrove forest, et cetera, um, that we're supporting, like, for example, in West Africa, uh, to help bring back some of that natural ecology to help this, the ecosystem support agriculture, maintain uh, water systems rather than the loss. And it's, it's novel. Um, and so its financial sustainability is not yet clear, but what we recognize is our, our traditional way of, you know, building, you know, dams and, um, you know, concrete channels is not sustainable and is not going to lead us to um, a climate resilient solution that we're going to need in the next 20 or 30 years. 
Thank, thanks, Drew. And I, uh, Tom Hobgood, actually, who's had a lot of experience in USA work in Tanzania, where we were considering, you probably remember some of that, the larger scale systems. He says, well, first of all, he says, how do we take irrigation to scale? So that's, I think, Nicole and uh, uh, Anku, a question about um, a small scale. But, and he says, um, he says, it seems we are focused on small scale. Are we reaching enough producers and processors to make a difference on reducing poverty? Well, I, I think Nicole spoke to that a bit. Um, have we given up on supporting large scale systems? So maybe that's a, a, a question. And of course, we, I think he's talking about the, the large community here. And I think, I think part of this is gonna come back to context, but uh, either Nicole or Koo, please, uh, please uh, share a comment here. You want to go first, Nicole? There you go. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I don't think that that there. I don't think that we've given up on larger scale. Um, and of course, when we talk about large scale, I think we mean the infrastructure, concrete projects, because those in in themselves can vary by scale. You know, we can have a smaller system that's infrastructure based with canals. Um, and you know maybe it's 200 farmers or we can have some that are 20,000 farmers but i think what we're talking about here is is the um, infrastructure based and i don't think that we've given up on that and i think that what we need to do is look a little bit more about the interaction between those systems and then the small scale household systems um, because what we see is there's a lot of those systems which have degraded and what farmers are doing is setting up their farms on the perimeter of those um, irrigation schemes and pumping water out of the schemes into their own land. And so there's a lot more um, attention that needs to be looked at in terms of how those two interact. But I don't think that we've given up on the infrastructure systems. Um, and like Ku said, I think we're looking much more about the um, you know nature-based op um, options. Um, it's still some type of infrastructure and support that's needed for that. Um, but it's, um, it, it is still a form of infrastructure and, and continuation of those systems, but looking about adaptability, about climate change and about what is best for that ecosystem. But um, I'll, I'll let Ku speak on this a little bit more. Yeah, no, I think this is directly related to the information systems challenge that we need to have a, a as Nicole said, a better understanding of the interaction between groundwater and surface water and the availability in smaller systems uh, such and then both at the local level you know the 20 to 50 kilometer range as well as a subnational and then a national level and then uh, transnational kind of uh, across the boundaries between regions because that is the area in which those smallholder farmers and either in a collective schemes or individually, as well as these larger holder farmers are gonna really be able to engage in Iraq. Because what the experience that I saw from uh, Peru was when, you know, obviously the glaciers in the Andes are melting. And so the government put restrictions and that basically uh, started charging farmers for water. Uh, suddenly what we saw was farmers paying attention to that and a significant reduction in water usage because they were having to pay for water in that case. Uh, and so we saw both larger systems and larger schemes of uh, where you had these large scale farmers who were reducing their water uh, usage because they could see how much it was costing them, as well as uh, an increase of uh, climate use systems and information systems to, to reduce water consumption. And in that specific case, in, uh, they reduced water usage by more than 19 billion liters of water in a three year period. And so I think that is a space in which we can start to engage on this a bit more, but it requires a, a stronger uh, investment in the science uh, and in, in the monitoring of water, which, you know, as that nature report said, you know, a week or two ago is a bit nascent right now. We, we bit, we're we a bit stronger. We walked away from it. We need to get back to it. So, so it sounds like information is critical to improve resource management and might I say governance, whatever that happens to look like. And um, Marie Soleil, um, we have a question, a comment here from uh, Flavio Linares. And my thing just moved without my, what happened there? Flavio, where's your comment? It moved by itself. Here we go. Uh, we need to move water smart agriculture to landscape management levels. What about insights 
what insights about this approach considering, considering watershed management? And Marie Soleil, I noticed in your slides, you show pictures where you definitely mix systems between forest, forested areas, maybe some of those are coffee areas, I, I, it's hard to say for sure, and, and areas that are more intensively cultivated. So um, how, you know, you mentioned the coffee piece, what about this issue more broadly? How do, what are your thoughts about getting this sort of uh, landscape level management that he refers to? Um, yeah, so I mean, touching on that again, that we, we were already discussing really um, strengthening local organizations and community um, involvement around planning at this level. I think it, it's really key. This is a, a focus of, of CRS um, in the regions um, where we're, we're um, taking this approach at the landscape level for natural resource conservation. So identifying where are these areas that we need to protect and uh, implementing uh, practices in on farm also and um, and making sure communities have access to the information for for decision making around soil climate risk um, and um, the tools that they need to to do that planning at the landscape level. Right and and. Um... I think that information piece is coming through in many of the questions or comments. And I say it's, I would suggest too that it's, it's, it's information that's science derived, but maybe also market derived, where you see people um, uh, looking about what to grow when and where. Uh, and um, I, it sounds like in a lot of the settings you're working in, Marie Soleil, it's really more the traditional systems but do you see those the, the, the downslope areas where people then can, you mentioned people can irrigate there. Do you see a, a very different set of crops being grown there, I'm assuming? Is that right? You see vegetables and such? Yeah, so um, CRS really takes um, a systems approach to creating um, the enabling environment where these practices um, can, can scale. And this means working in uh, market systems and uh, financial services um, and all these extension models to, um, to, to create this, this enabling environment. And our market systems work is also including like diversification. So it's not just a focus on um, necessarily uh, the, the um, staple crops, but diversifying with, um, with market crops um, to, to um, diversify income for farmers, where we know that um, in many cases, at the small scale, some of the um, maize and bean crops um, are not um, lucrative right. enough um, uh, to bring farmers out of poverty. Um, and so this is a real focus in this next phase of the WSA2 program to incorporate more of the uh, building entrepreneurship also in rural areas, working with youth and building opportunities for youth and uh, women. Um, especially youth that can stay in their communities and um, and really revitalize these uh, these uh, rural economies to create opportunities in a the agriculture sector, not only production but also providing uh, services in the agriculture sector. Yeah, that's and that's uh, one of the very exciting things that have been. I think Nicole mentioned this, but this and if I would just step back and say so much of what we do is trying to capitalize under capitalized systems in small holder friendly ways. So this whole issue of service provision, creation of jobs for youth, and also given the higher value, and I thank Mary, Mary Soleil for calling out this, this issue around diversification is so central to our some of our theories about how people can get out of poverty. Uh, because it's just the staple crops, even if you do everything right, it may not move a family of four or six out of poverty. If you get some uh, uh, diversification in there, and then that service provision opportunity is uh, very exciting. And it, one of the things that we see is that it's coming to Africa. Um, but I wanted to ask: we had a question um, from Mary Marie Mary Purvis, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, she wanted to thank us for flagging the connection to animal source foods from irrigation. But, and I think poultry was mentioned, various have been mentioned, fish, of course, uh, in, in systems that are more water uh, uh, friendly or have a lot of water.
but she said, um, can you uh, call, um, call, she asked about the production of animal forage and fodder, uh, uh, Nicole, and I see you nodding too, as a, as a real money-making opportunity. And I see Marie Soleil nodding. Could you say a little bit about the connection to of water and the in, in any of these settings to um, animals and and the opportunities for both nutrition and poverty reduction gains. Yeah, I'll start well, with the irrigated fodder. Um, in in Ethiopia, we found and in a lot of countries in in um, the global south and in sub-Saharan Africa, there's a growing market for fodder. Um, you know, in countries like Ethiopia or Niger, where um, livestock make us a large part of the ag GDP. Um, but they also have major constraints in terms of animal feed. And so we're seeing these growing markets for animal feed and for local fodder. And what we found is there's multiple pathways to profitability through irrigating fodder. That's both in terms of having your own cattle and um, in terms of, you know, increasing the milk production, which we found increased multi multifold by having better quality feed. Um, which means the, the irrigated fodder. Um, also, the, there's some of the fodders require a lot less um, agrochemicals and other inputs. So farmers found that their margins actually improved when they switched to irrigated fodder. So there's multiple um, ways in which fodder can increase profitability for the farmers, but then at the same time, increase the access to particularly dairy products on the market. And, um, but I also had mentioned one of the, one of the, um, markets for solar pumps that we found really strong was poultry and these were oftentimes egg farmers you know they, these were they tended to be women um in fairly remote areas they needed a good clean source of water for egg production and poultry production and these were really profitable um profitable systems so we found multiple ways in which um, just having access to water enabled better animal feed and better animal health fattening, um, you know, more milk production, better egg production, lower um, problems with the animal um, health and, and disease. So from our side and um, what we saw with water, there's huge potential um, for improving access to animal source foods. Wonderful, with terrific income opportunities for producers and people all along. You know, these value chains tend to be more employment intensive too, and then with the higher value. Uh, products. Uh, Koo, do you want to come in? And then Marie Soleil, please, everybody can join on this one. So sure, quickly, in, you know, what I've seen both in up and coming in Egypt and in India um, is fly production uh, for chicken food and chicken waste, and then that leading to uh, compost, which then improves soil health and soil moisture retention. And so you can get this circular economy where you can produce uh, additional waste that then is good for the land, also produce flies, which has been good uh, for like chicken feed. And what we're starting to see is that uh, moving over into insect production, because we now recognize we need increased protein sources. Um, we're not going to be able to chicken and cow our way out of uh, the world's development. And so we need additional protein sources. And these are one way in which you can increase soil moisture retention and uh, on-farm and off-farm uh, food productivity. Great. Uh, so linking that circularity in the system to to all the positive benefits we've been talking in terms about availability, affordability of, of, of these quality, nutritious foods. Marie Soleil, what about the context you're in? How, how do yeah, you... so in the context of soil health, um, so, um, you know, per keeping the soil covered, permanent uh, cover, is just so key to um, to drought resilience in these systems, and um, and so there's a, a trade off with crop residues for feeding those to animals versus feeding them to the soil, and so this yes. is another area that we're um, working in is diversifying um, forage crops, alternative forages, so that the crop residues can stay on the soil. So, so um, you know anything that we can. Um, do if, if it means uh, you know any irrigation also in, in in specific situations but also in just purely rain fed systems this is also very important um, to to diversify and um, with these alternative forages and uh, and leave the residues on the soil 
Yeah, no, and that 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 issue that you're flagging there is is it's huge across almost everywhere we work in feed the future, and 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 and, and the, the irony is that we know the future of a lot of the really providing quality diets to people that have adequate animal source foods is going to depend on these mixed systems. It's not it can't all come from pastoralist systems. They're just not big enough. All the water management there is, is another critical piece. Um, I want to just share with others the Tom Reardon from Michigan State University. He's done work now that shows in Zambia, 200,000 farm families have moved into veg commercial vegetable production in the last 10 years. And that's to provide food uh, and quality uh, diets to uh, African cities and towns. So I, I like to think of, and water's at the heart of that transition, by the way. It's small scale irrigation, a lot of it through informal finance, just from families. But I think as Ku kind of signaled earlier, opening the way towards more of, uh, of the private sector coming in with additional opportunities uh, uh, for finance. So that's, I like to think that that's the head of the spear in terms of this transformation of food systems where we can do it. But it's great to also hear that this is happening in rain fed systems uh, and, and that, you know, all of this is reducing uh, risk while increasing opportunities for profits and driving investment. Let's see, um, let me see if anybody of the, uh, my colleagues want to help me out with all these great questions and comments, I'm happy to take a suggestion. Uh, let's see. Let me get here. Uh, some people want to know, uh, Nicole, what small scale irrigation looks like. Uh, drip kits, sprinklers, rain guns, uh, foot pumps. Uh, any any comments on the technology that's, yeah. that's uh, driving yeah. these transfers? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely certain technologies that we see that um, tend to be profitable in a shorter period of time. Um, and we see certain types of technologies that are more robust. Um, and, um, you know, we definitely see farmers investing in their own petrol and diesel pumps, their own solar pumps. Um, increasingly, we're seeing them put in sprinklers um through because you know the the pvc and the pipes are available on the local market and, and and locally produced um we see fewer farmers investing in their own drip kits um and there is a major issue in terms of the the technology to profitability related to labor so what farmers are really going for is technologies that reduce labor in terms of water lifting so that's the pumping as well as on field distribution um, and so we see a lot of the technology adoption actually driven by labor availability and labor cost. And the other issue around technology is not thinking about technology as the issue of profitability, but the market, um, the off taker market and, and where that produce is going is also really driving what technologies are adopted. So, you know, you have to really look at the technology and the overall market system and understand the labor dynamics, the farm size, but really that off taker market as well. So people make these integrated decisions when they decide they're, they're looking at all these things, but the information piece is critical. Ku, I saw you nodding about this. Can you, did you want to add some points on this? Point, yeah, just uh, on this. quickly on uh, the off-taker market. Uh, you know, one of the things that I saw in India and Nepal around solar cold storage, both, and then other biogas cold storage, was farmers were making daily or monthly decisions around, all right, do I want to store this or sell it immediately? Uh, and that's because, you know, every farmer is an entrepreneur and they're trying to increase their profitability because, you know, their livelihood is dependent upon it. And I think if we think of farmers in that way, you know, also sometimes as ecologists, because they're trying to, pre and, and traditionalists, because they're trying to, pre you know, preserve their heritage as well, rather than just like these quote unquote farmers that we often think of in development. It adds context to who they are as people uh, and helps us understand the types of decisions they're going to make. Sometimes that if you looked at it just from 
you know, a traditional perspective, it would seem irrational. But if you think about it in with these other all, overall context in mind, are quite rational and, and smart decision making policies. And, you know, one of the things Nicole talked about earlier is that women were much less likely to adopt some of these things unless they had all of the inputs they needed to be successful. And that's a very wise strategy if you think about it in the larger context. And I think if as we look at these systems, as we try to build these connections, we keep that in mind, I think we'll be much more likely to be successful in the next five to 15 years. Great, and Marie Soleil, maybe you get the last word on this in terms of you know, how, how, what, what is it, what kinds of information needs and, and the issues around labor and all these things, how do you see those coming together in the context you're working in? Yeah, so I, you know, I mentioned this need for plot level information, so namely soil information, climate information, so that farmers can manage their risk, manage um, the input use um, in the context of that risk. Very, very important, and and then also, you know, at the at the landscape level for managing natural resources and. And those associated risks, and um, in in terms of water security, also. So those two different like levels of, of information are, are really key. Does labor become a big issue? I mean, in terms of people like leaving the farm to go do something else, or how, does that become a factor too? Or is it in the settings you're in? Is it primarily farm families themselves doing doing? Uh, no, I, doing that's labor? I mean that's definitely. Um, Something that's happening in Central America, um, yeah. uh, you know, migration from rural areas, um, women um, being now more likely the the head of the farm, where it was uh, in the past men. So, um, you know, this is, is definitely something that we're considering uh, in our programming, also. But also, you know, trying to create those opportunities for people to stay in their communities. Um, right. People don't want to leave their communities. Um, what if they, for economic reasons, um, they often have to make those hard decisions. So creating this uh, rural um, rural co economic uh, opportunities is, is really key. Yeah, and I, I think that's true globally, but especially where you are. And I know it's something that we get asked a lot about here in, in USA, but I, anyway, I, I know we run out of time. It's, I think you guys, you've been a fantastic panel. Uh, it's such a rich discussion. I think we tried to really look at climate change, look at landscape approaches, look at finance at different levels, look at the connections to economic uh, growth, poverty reduction, and, and, and nutrition improvement. Uh, 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 probably, the, we didn't talk about health much, but that's embedded in there. I think you talked about clean water. I think you did Marie Soleil or, or Nicole, and how important that can be to economic opportunities, but also uh, you mentioned for, I think, poultry, one of you. Anyway, um, it's fantastic. I know there's some interest, in it, Michael, uh, that people want to see more of the questions, and maybe we can have an ongoing chat developed from this, but it, clearly uh, uh, an issue that's not going anywhere. It's going to be more and more important. But excitingly, we have a whole diverse array of tools and investment approaches that I think are, are being leading to innovation. A lot of it ground up, which is exciting too. Michael, I turn it back to you. And thank you all. But thank the audience as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Just a quick note that we are going to publish the recording of this event. We're going to publish the slide deck, and then and we will also put online on the AgriLink site a recording of the QA. This is one of our most active Q&A panels that we've seen, um, probably the highest yeah. volume of questions that we've ever gotten. So thank you all so much. Really, really yeah, great. I, was, I couldn't keep up everybody. And I, I should mention gender too. That was a theme right through it. Yeah. Thank you absolutely. all. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.